Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 92 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench, one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farm CSA out in Elmore, Ohio. I'm also the founder of My Digital Farmer, which is all about trying to help other farmers like me get better and more confident at doing sales and marketing. So if you're one of those farmers that feels like you've got the growing part down, you've got production down, but you're not so sure how to go about selling it and finding new customers and keeping them coming back, then this is the place to come and tune in every week. That's what I'm trying to help farmers get better at. So if you're here for the first time, I want to say a special welcome. Thanks for giving me a shot, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. There are a ton of other back issues that you can listen to in the archives. I recommend you take some time to go through those and find the ones that appeal to you. So much good content that's been shared over the last two years. If you enjoy this episode, please hit the subscribe tab so that I can tune into your podcast player every single week. And for all of my regular fans who have been tuning in week after week, all of you who send me these awesome emails and saying thank you or sharing ways that you've used my information to help you get better at what you do, thanks for doing that. That actually really fuels me and keeps me going uh, every single week when I sit down to record this. I really enjoy getting that feedback. So... Today's show notes can be found at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 92. Any of the links that I share will be there. And before I get started, I just feel like I need to warn you, you may hear some barking in the background. So we got a new puppy last week, a golden retriever. She's 10 weeks old. We named her Harley and she is awesome. We love her so much. Um, my, My husband and my boys just left the house so that I could have some time alone to podcast. And... The dog, unfortunately, has been barking um, every now and then. She hasn't really barked a ton, so hopefully she'll calm down. Right now she's demolishing one of my wooden spoons from the kitchen, and that'll hopefully keep her happy for the next 40 minutes. So today's episode, I'm going to talk to you about the weekly email. (laughs) Now, I know some of you are groaning right now, and before you go and hit the stop button, I just want to make a case for why I think the weekly email is such an important part of your marketing strategy. If you were to look at my marketing machine, all the different systems that I've put into place that are working together to attract leads into my business, turn them into customers, and then get them to continue to buy more and more and become loyal fans, that system There's a lot of different moving parts, and one of those key systems is the weekly email. It has a place in this customer value journey. And so I want to make a case today to kind of explain to you what is it that the weekly email does, what does it do, why is it valuable, and I want to give you some very strategic, specific strategies for how to write them, because I know that's the reason why many of you aren't giving it a shot, because you sit down and you have writer's block, and you're not sure, how do I write these so that people will want to keep opening them? So... What is the weekly email in a nutshell? It is a weekly communication touch point through email with your email list where you connect with them either with a story or maybe you have some information you need them to know or maybe you're pitching them an offer, but it's a weekly touch point. Now, it doesn't have to be every week. If you're afraid of email fatigue, I get that, but there should be maybe every two weeks. That's probably the longest I would go. In the off season, right after the CSA is over and after Thanksgiving, I do take about four weeks during the month of December where I don't email my list at all. But after that, I am back into the rhythm of connecting with them on a, on a weekly basis. And there's a really good reason for that, which I want to kind of go over here, I'll go over with you in this episode. Now, I can already hear you groaning because I know you're asking yourself, Corinna, what if those people end up unsubscribing. Like if I write them all the time, every single week, aren't they going to start getting sick of it? They don't open them all the time and they're eventually going to just say, get rid of this person off my, off my list. Well, it's possible that you will have people that unsubscribe. I get unsubscribes every single time that I send out an email to my list. 
That is par for the course. But I want you to realize that the people that are unsubscribing are probably not your ideal customer anyway. And so it's okay if you've ended up repelling them and letting them go. Now, if you have a huge unsubscribe rate, then we need to have a conversation. But it is normal to have a few people dropping off your list every time you email them. And that is frankly not a bad thing. I often tell people you kind of want people to unsubscribe if they're not your ideal client because they're probably not opening your emails and they're bringing down your email score. So don't be afraid of the unsubscribe if, if it's, you know, not a huge number. I want you to think about it this way. You go to all this work to get people to subscribe to your email list in the first place. And then if you don't do anything to stay in touch with them, like what good is it doing you, right? It's sort of like asking a girl for her number. Like in the dating scene, you see someone from afar and you ask her for her number and then you're too afraid to call them. And you never do anything with the number. This, that's sort of what, like what's happening if you get an email list and you never write them. This is an opportunity once you have them on your list to grow that relationship, to warm them up, cultivate them, add value to them, prove to them that you're worth listening to. And once you've got that relationship established, then we can start turning them into a customer. So let's talk a little bit about what the weekly email actually accomplishes. And then we'll talk about how to write them well so that people will actually open them. So when done well, okay, when written well, and we'll talk about how to do that in a second, the weekly email does a lot of things for your business. Number one, the most important thing is that it's creating a connection with your client or with your lead or your customer over time. And as they read your emails, maybe they're not opening every single one, but they're reading a certain percentage. Every time they open one, it builds that know, like, and trust factor, right? It's either indoctrinating them into your community and the way that you work. It's helping them feel like they're turning into one of your followers. It could be warming them up. It could be endearing you to them through a story that you tell. They start to see you as a trusted guide in the field. Okay. So remember they're coming to your farm, to your business, because you have something that they're looking for. You're solving a problem for them, or there's a deep desire that they have that your product can give them. And so you are positioning yourself. You need to position yourself as a guide to show them I can lead you there. And that's going to take a little bit of time. You've got to build that trust. So that's the first kind of main thing that it does. It's, it's building that connection with that potential client. The second thing that it does, and don't discount this, is that it trains the click, okay? It trains people to click on links. So every single email that you write, almost every single one, should have something in there that they can click on. And a, a lot of times it's not necessarily something they buy. It could be a resource. It could be a blog post. It could be a, a video you want them to watch, something that's going to add value to them. It could be a freebie that you give them. And every time they have a positive response to, tra or to clicking on that link, it makes them think, oh man, when I click on links, good things happen. When you then have an offer to present to them in an email and you have a, a link for that, it, they'll be more likely to click because they've been clicking. Every week, they've, it's almost like they're clicking on a link and this becomes an easier practice for them to do. Okay, So this concept of training the click is a part of... Um, the emails, the weekly emails job. Number three, the weekly email reminds them that you exist and that you are an expert in your field. Okay, so even if they don't open every email and they will not, you are right. When you send a weekly email out there, they may open all of them like the first three times. And then after that, they're maybe going to stop doing it every single time, but they will still open them periodically. And so even if they don't open every email, they at least see you show up in their inbox. They see your name as the sender and they're reminded that you exist and it keeps you on their radar. That way, when it's time for them, maybe when they're like, I'm ready to you know, engage with them, that I know they have a, a solution to my problem, you're going to be top of mind because you've been showing up on a regular basis in their inbox. Do not discount that. That is a really big deal. Uh, I know that I send out emails to my farmer email list, right? To let you guys know that I've got a podcast every week. And I, I can tell that you guys aren't always clicking every single one of them. But 
I know that when there's a certain podcast topic that interests you, you will click on it. And so it's all about making sure that you just start to see me as someone who has authority in the marketing space. And you're going to remember Corinna. You're going to remember My Digital Farmer is someone that is known for talking about marketing and messaging. And that has value in and of itself, even if you don't open every single one of my emails. Okay, So I really want you to embrace that idea that part of this is just reminding people you exist. Number four, the weekly email is off, often communicating necessary information. That's not always the case, but sometimes you have information that you need to share with your customers, and this is the, the way to do it. And if you have consistently delivered really good content in your weekly emails and they look forward to opening them, they're more likely to open a, the email that has that important information in them. And then finally, weekly emails can actually make you money. Now, I don't, I don't recommend that every single email should have an offer that you're pitching. That gets really old. That's when it starts to feel salesy to a customer and when they unsubscribe, okay? But if some of your emails are just stories or endearing things that show your heart and your personality, some of them might be things that you give away freebies in um, or a link to this or you teach them something. Every time they open the email, there's something good that happens. Then once in a while when you actually are trying to sell something or you just throw it into the P.S., but it's not the main piece of the email, it doesn't feel weird to be selling to them. And you can occasionally do a hardcore pitch with an email and they'll open it and it will convert for you. Okay, so those are kind of the top five things that I could think of, the value of the weekly email. It's training the click, it's building connection, it's reminding people that you exist, it's branding you as an authority in the space, it's communicating important information, and occasionally it even makes you money. So I want to talk about how often do you have to send the weekly email? Do you really have to send it every single week? And I would argue during your CSA season, yes, you need to send a weekly email every single week to your customers to explain to them what's going on in the box, um, what resources you have to share that week, what funny things happened on the farm, telling your story, sharing pictures, like that's important. In the off season, when you're a little on a little bit of a break, I think you can go a little less often if you need to, but I wouldn't go any longer than two to three weeks. Either way, you need to set a pattern. You need to make a decision. Is it every week? Is it every two weeks? And try to remain consistent, partly because your customer needs to see that, but also because the email algorithm pays attention to that. And you have a greater chance of showing up in the inbox and not the promotions tab if you are showing the algorithm that you consistently send this on the same time and same day of the week. Today's episode is brought to you by my free training, Why They Buy. Did you know that there are six key triggers that make someone more likely to say yes when you ask them to buy your product? Wouldn't you like to know what they are so that you can use them in your marketing? I thought so. This is why I created a training called Why They Buy the Six Reasons People Buy Your Product. I originally made this as a paid workshop for a conference last year, and it was so popular with those farmers that I decided that I should turn it into a video training in its own right and make it available to anyone. So this video training is totally free. I'm not selling anything on the back end. It takes about an hour to listen to, and you can access it at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash why they buy. I consider this content to be one of the fundamentals of marketing. So if you're trying to get better at marketing, this is one of the first things you should learn. When I learned this stuff from my mentors, I was blown away. And I have since shared this information with other farmers who have also seen results. I'm here to tell you that these triggers really do work when used responsibly. You'll find the training inside my CSA Academy at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash why they buy. Now, as you sit down to write and compose these emails, you want the email content to be good. If it isn't, if the style is repetitive and the stuff you write is kind of fluff and there's not really anything valuable in there, you will be essentially training people that they don't have to open it because 
there wasn't anything valuable that came out of that email. So we need to watch out for that. And that may, part, that may be partly why you're reluctant to do a weekly email because you haven't quite mastered that um, ability to write in an engaging way or to write information that's, that makes the email actually valuable. Be sure that as you're putting stuff together in this email that you're really asking yourself, is this adding value to my person? If it's not, then I need to, I need to take a little more time and think about what it is that I should write about. All right, let's talk about the format, the basic format of a good weekly email. I know some of you might be using things like MailChimp where your uh, weekly email software is an actual template, right? Where you can put your header up above and you've got like a column over here and you stick your picture in the picture template box and then you got another article down here. If, if that's how you write emails and you want to make like a newspaper type email, go for it. But what I'm talking about today is more of like a text only email where you've got one focused piece of content. You don't have multiple stories going on at the same time. It's one focused message to avoid confusion and one image that's in there and you sign off at the end. So here's the basic formula that I typically follow. And I use ConvertKit as my email service provider because it is a text only email provider. It doesn't have all the fancy templates. And that's my personal preference because when I send an email, I want it to feel like a letter, not like a newspaper. To me, that feels as if I were to get an email like that, it would feel more like a personal email. When I get something that looks like a newspaper, I can tell that's being sent to a whole bunch of people. And I want to make it look like I'm writing it to just one person. So I really recommend ConvertKit. Um, Active Campaign is another really good one. Um, and I'll put the links for those in the show notes if you want to check them out. I'm an affiliate for ConvertKit. So you can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash ConvertKit and try that out and see if you like that. Okay, let's talk about the format. So when I sit down to write them, here's kind of the formula that I'm following. First of all, I think about my subject line. The email subject line, the only job of the email subject line is to get the person to open the email. And that is obviously a very important step. Like I always write the email first and then I spend about five, 10 minutes trying to come up with a good headline that's gonna make somebody open it. If your open rates are really low, one of the reasons may be that you're not creating a dynamic enough subject line and the headline to the email just may be something you need to work on. So I do take some time to craft a really good headline. They're not all amazing. Some are better than others, but I, I do think that's important. The second thing is to come up with some kind of an interesting hook in the opening paragraph. So maybe it's just like a one-liner sentence that's only one sentence long in the first paragraph a question that draws them in and leaves them hanging and makes them want to keep reading. So you're kind of thinking like if you were writing the end of a sitcom or the end of a soap opera, if you've ever watched soap operas, I used to watch them a lot when I was younger. At the end of the 30 minute episode, there's always this cliffhanger for they go to the credits, leaving you hanging so that you'll come back the next day and see what happens. And you kind of have to think that way when you're writing like that first sentence in your email needs to be like the hook that draws them in and makes them want to keep reading further. So we have an interesting subject line. We have some kind of a hook in the very first sentence. And then there's the bulk of the email. So this is where there's a story. I tell a story or maybe there's a teaching tip or maybe I show some vulnerability about something that happened in my life. And I'm going to walk through some of those templates in just a minute. Okay. But this is the meat of the email. Uh, it's not super long. I don't want people to feel like they have to read this email for, you know, 10 minutes. It's pretty short trying to get to the point pretty quickly, but there is definitely a section where there's the meat of the information. I also include one picture and I do that to break up the text. You don't want to have emails that are just one giant long block of text because that exhausts the eye. So I'm always like hitting the carriage return, trying to make short sentences, put lots of white space in there. But I have a picture that's helping break up that text. And the picture somehow relates to the story that I'm telling or it somehow relates to the hook. And then finally, I have something to click. There is a call to action in the email whether it's to head to my store and check this out or go download this freebie that I made for you or check out this uh, video link that um, I put in place for you or this blog post that's going to teach you this. I have all different kinds of ideas for calls to action, but I want them to click something because I want to be training them to click my emails. 
That way, when I finally have something to sell eventually, it won't be so weird for them to be clicking because they've always been clicking in my emails. So now that we know what the basic formula for a email is, let's talk about what do you actually talk about? What's the meat of that email look like? And I want to share seven different templates or categories. What I did is I looked back at some of my weekly emails and I was trying to look for the patterns. What are the types of things that I tend to talk about in them? And I made a short list. There's lots of kind of outliers, but these are the ones that I think will help you as you sit down to write your own. So it might be helpful for you. If you can't do it right now, that's fine. But you might, you might want to come back to this part of the podcast and start making a list and write them all down. And just put that on your phone or tape it to the wall or something next to your computer so that when you have that writer's block moment, you can kind of look at that and it can unlock you. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Template number one is what I call the wise farmer template. And this is where I think of some kind of a parable or a story that actually happened in my life, either that week or in my past, and that story becomes the hook of the email. And you want the story to teach some kind of a life lesson. So what I think about as I write that, I think about, okay, well, what happened? I have to talk about what happened in the story, what you learned from that, and how it's relevant, how it applies to your customer, and what you want them to do now with that information. How can they take that and make it relevant for their life? So an example of this might be talk about a parenting decision that you made that past week and what you learned from it and encourage them to take away that same lesson and apply it in their life. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, Krina, that has nothing to do with vegetables or meat or whatever it is. And you're right, it doesn't. But that isn't necessarily the goal of every email. You're not always trying to sell your product in every single email. What you're doing with the daily email or the weekly email is you're trying to connect with your audience. You're trying to show your life and your values and what you stand for because people are buying your brand too. They're buying you along with the product. And so They want to get to know who you are and what you stand for. And if they read these emails and they're not connecting with you and they're like, this is not, you know, what I stand for, they probably will end up unsubscribing. And that's okay um, because that just means that they're not probably your ideal client. Um, I learned this, especially when I was doing an interview with Cassie Nolterweiss. I'm going to say her name wrong, but um, I interviewed her uh, a few months ago. I'll put the link in the show notes. So you can go back and listen to it. But she talked about this too, that she began to embrace email marketing and she discovered that the emails that got the most engagement where she would get responses back from people (laughs) were the ones where she wasn't necessarily talking about vegetables or even what, what she did on the farm that week. It was the ones where she was sharing from her life and like things that were going on in her life. So what it was like to be a mom or a parenting decision that she made, or uh, something that happened at school when she took her kids to school, whatever. So I want you to think about like stories from your everyday life that will captivate someone, that will give them a peek into your character and into your values. So here's some other examples. Talk about a mistake that you made once and what you learned from it. Uh, Talk about how you came to have one of your values that's really important to you. You can tell the story, the origin story of that. Talk about one of your favorite hobbies and maybe something funny that happened. Um, Talk about a memory from your childhood and a lesson that you learned from that or a relationship that matters a lot to you and why. You could talk about a funny thing that happened on your vacation or on a a road trip. You could talk talk about something your kids did that last week that you thought was hilarious or that maybe was wise. Um, You could talk about a problem that you're currently dealing with and open up and be a little vulnerable about how it's frustrating. You know, I've shared stories about homeschooling and how sometimes I feel like a failure about XYZ, right? And I show people my heart that I don't always have it together. So this is the section where you're telling a story. Stories are so powerful, like our brains are wired to to hear stories and to remember them. So the key here is to share a small vignette of your life and make sure that you're pulling out the lesson to learn. That's why I call it the parable. 
Um, you want to pull out that kernel of truth that you want them to learn from you and then how it could be applied to their life. Okay. And that's sort of the kernel of the story. And I promise you these kinds of stories, even if you're not pitching something in them, they, people read them, they will get to the end and be like, Oh, wow, that was so good. That was inspiring. Or that was really wise. And your status as the guide is elevated through that. Okay. So that's the first template. Think through the parable. What parable could you tell? All right. Template number two is what I call pull back the kimono. <laughs> Um, or otherwise known as behind the scenes of your life. And again, this doesn't have to be behind the scenes of your business, although that's usually what I mean by this, but it could also be just behind the scenes of some other element of your life. So for example, you could share a behind the scenes moment from your business. Um, what you're actually doing out in the fields on XYZ day and why little stories that most people don't know about, the hidden stories of why farming is so rewarding or why it's so hard or problems that you struggle through and victories that you have that may not seem like big deals to other people, but they're really big to you. Like talk about that stuff. Now, what's cool about this template is that when someone reads this, again, it's told like a story, they feel like they're getting special access because the way that we write it, it's sort of like, hey, I don't tell this to everyone. Um, here's kind of a sneak peek of what's really going on behind the farm, right? That kind of makes someone feel like you are letting them peek into the real world. There's that transparency buzzword that's getting activated when you talk about it as if it's something behind the scenes. So vulnerability, once again, is okay here. It shows that you're human and it it's what connects you to them. It makes them endear themselves to you. You don't seem like a superhuman uh, person anymore, but a little more accessible. And people do like that. Plus, it's telling the story of the farm and the food. And one of the things that people are buying when they're joining a CSA is they're buying transparency. They they want transparency. They want the story. Maybe they don't tell you that, but I'm here to tell you <laughs> that that is actually what they want. They don't just want the vegetables. They want to know their farmer and they want to know the story behind their food. And they're secretly hoping that that's part of the package too. So sharing the inside scoop on our industry, did you know, dot, 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 like little aha moments like that are going to be a big deal for them. Okay, so that's a really, a really strong one. I often lean into that one. I look around on the farm. I'm like, what story can I showcase today that most people don't know about? And that's going to be interesting to them. Uh, I remember I always do some kind of an email every year about how uh, the, the, zucchini plant has um, a male flower and a female flower on the same plant. And I talk about that just because I remember when I learned that as a brand new farm wife, I just thought that was so cool. And so I think back to the days when before I became the farmer that I am now, the things that, that were so interesting to me, and I often lean into those stories and reveal those as like special secrets, right? Okay, let's move on to template number three. Template number three is a teaching tip or basic content release. Content release. So what do I mean by this? You have a ton of knowledge in your head about how to cook stuff, how to be successful with the, the food that you produce, how to actually execute in the kitchen. I know that you do. And so if you can, you know, share just one of those tips and put that in the email and blow someone's mind, like that would be super valuable. So I want you to imagine that you're like a blog, a food blogger, or you're writing for Cooking Light magazine. And I want, it maybe it would even be helpful for you to go to some of those food blogs and just see what is it that they talk about. I used to get a subscription to several food magazines and I would do that. I would page through them and look for the headlines. And they always had like certain themes uh, every month where they're focused on a certain vegetable or they had cooking tips or um, equipment reviews, right? They had certain categories like that. And I would tear pages out if something jumped out at me. And I would think to myself, that's cool. I can share that as a tip someday in an email. So I want you to think like a food blogger or maybe do some research by going to some of these food magazines and just find some cool tips that you can share and file away. And that can be the one nugget. Remember, it doesn't have to be a long email. You're just looking for one small nugget that you can put in there that's going to add value to your reader. So it could be a kitchen tip. 
It could be an aha moment, like some kind of secret knowledge that you learned. Um, it could be a shortcut in the kitchen that you want to share with them. Um, it could be something like five ways to eat radishes, right? Like that's when I go to those food blogs and I find like lists like that. It could be something viral. I remember in my Facebook group a few years ago, I had a customer share a recipe for how to make chocolate beet muffins. So they couldn't figure out what to do with beets. And they tried this chocolate beet muffin recipe and they were like, oh my gosh, I couldn't even taste the beets. It was amazing. And it spurred this, like tons of people in our Facebook groups tried out this beet muffin recipe and they loved it. And now it's something that's like every single year we share it again and it goes viral yet again. So when I when you have certain things like that, these little aha moments that are awesome pieces of content, like file those away and share those in your emails. So in 2018, I was on this content release bandwagon where I was trying to create this library of resources for my CSA members. And I would make cheat sheets like formula for a perfect pesto, formula for a perfect sheet pan meal, um, how to create do-it-yourself vegetable broth. And I basically spelled out the formula and I used an infographic. I made it in Canva. And uh, I have a ton of these resources now. I have an ebook for every vegetable. And so I would release those as a weekly email. I would say, hey, this week I made uh, a veggie ebook for Kohlrabi. If you want it, click here. And you know, when they clicked on it, it would take them right to that download and they could open it up. And every week they're waiting, oh, what's she going to release this week? Oh, it's a video about this, this, and this. That's so cool. So if you want to get on the content train like that, you could start creating a piece of weekly content, and that could be the thing that you share every week in your email. Now, that's a ton of extra work, but that is, that is actually what I did. And now I have this huge library of materials that lives inside of my digital academy and that all my CSA members get access to, but it's awesome because I have tons of stuff that I can go back to and pull out and repurpose and I can send it out again and say, hey, don't forget, I've got this ebook on so-and-so or I've got this cheat sheet on how to uh, pickle just about anything. And that has been a, a really awesome resource to have. It's a great library. I can just pull new things out. So that's, a, that's an idea, having a content release or a teaching tip. And that's the one little nugget that you share. Now, if you are looking for ideas for what that content teaching tip could look like, you may want to join my uh, digital academy. So it's called the CSA Academy. It's for my CSA members, but I have a fair number of farmers that are subscribed to it as well. And inside of that academy, I have, you know, uh, all these training materials and lots of downloads. I have video trainings for every vegetable. I have an ebook for every vegetable. I have these exit strategies like formula for a perfect pesto. Like I mentioned before, I have tons of those that are documents that people can download and just use as cheat sheets for in the kitchen. So if you want ideas of what they could even be, you may want to join the Academy for a month or two. It's a monthly subscription. And you can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash academy to uh, learn more about that and to see what's inside there. You can join for a month, take a look at the resources, get ideas, download them, use them as like examples for how to build your own uh, in Canva. And that might be super, super helpful in unlocking you for for what to write in these content releases. So I have a lot of farmers that have joined the Academy on a monthly basis and are just in there for like six months during the season and kind of use that as their go-to for resources to help support their members. So that's a thought if you want to do that. Okay, um, let's move to template number four. Template number four is to start with a feeling. What do I mean by this? Start with a feeling. So before you sit down and try to figure out what to talk about, ask yourself this question. How do I want my customer to feel or the person on my email list to feel at the end of reading this email? And then I think about what story can I pull from my past that's going to inspire them to feel this way. Now, I used this strategy all the time when I was a youth pastor and I had to deliver a talk or a message or a sermon in front of my parishioners or in front of my students, I would sit there and think, okay, the theme for the day that I have to teach them on is X, Y, Z. Or maybe I wanted to tell a story like, I want these people to feel encouraged. Um, so I'm going to think of a story where uh, I had to push through and how good it felt to push through because I finally got there and I succeeded and I went the distance. 
And even though it was hard, I made it, right? So I would find the story that makes that feeling happen. So that's a really powerful way. It's a kind of a trick that they teach you in seminary, actually, to start with the feeling. What is it that you want people to feel at the end of your story? And then find an illustration um, from your life that you can share that's going to inspire that emotion to happen at the end. That is one that I often lean into. It works really, really well. Again, the goal is not always to get them to buy something in that email. I mean, you could throw a little offer in your PS, but you want them to read the story and feel inspired. And then at the end, be like, oh, man, that made me feel amazing. I love reading her emails, right? That's what we're going for. And guess what? When they feel that way, the next time they see an email come from you in the uh, inbox, they're going to be more likely to click it if they always have a sense of value after reading it. Okay, template number five. This one is one that you would use like in the season of CSA when you're putting together your CSA newsletter. Um, interview someone. Interview someone that's in your customer base. People love to hear stories of transformation of people who are like them. So is there someone's story from your customer base or from your CSA that you can spotlight? And I used to put this in my weekly uh, newsletter, CSA newsletter, I had a section called interview with a CSA member or member spotlight, I think is what I called it. And I had about, I don't know, 10 to 15 questions. And I would call up customers every week. Sometimes I would kind of batch them. I would do like three in a row. And I would interview them and ask them these questions. And I would write down their responses. And then it would basically be a story that I could tell. Or sometimes I would just have the question and their response. Um, kind of dependent on how I wanted to write it. But what was really cool about that is that I would have um, customers who who would tell me that that was the one section they always enjoyed reading because they liked to hear about other people that were in their community and they were kind of looking to see if they thought like them, if they were similar to them. And I know that I had people who were hoping that I would call them and that maybe they would be the ones who would get featured and be chosen for that particular article. Another way that you could do this, if you have a Facebook group, you could do something like a Facebook group roundup section in your email. And this is where I'll go through the Facebook posts for the, the past week and I'll pick out my favorite posts that were made by members of our CSA. Maybe someone shared a really cool um, recipe that kind of went viral in the group or maybe someone had a um, mindset that they overcame that week and they shared that victory with us. And I'll take a screenshot of it or I'll take the words and I'll just share it in the email and talk about, hey, this was in our Facebook group this week. So-and-so talked about how this happened and then this happened. Read her screenshot here. And it helps, once again, kind of interview someone, right, and show the transformation of how someone's changing. People love to see themselves um, getting featured. They love the idea of learning from one another. So I think that this can be really powerful um, as well. It's a little bit of extra work, but it can be kind of a theme that you have going. Template number six is the promotion announcement. Okay, so this is the one that we all think of first when we're sitting down in front of an email. We're like, oh, I'm going to talk about something that I want them to buy. So yes, we should have a place for this. This should show up in your weekly email rotation at some point, but it should not be every single week. You should not lead with, hey, now I have this to buy. Uh, we always want to have some other kind of main content in the body of our email. And if you need to let people know, hey, I'm going to the farmer's market this week, here's what I'm going to have, then throw that in the PS. But don't always make it the main feature of your content. If you have a promotional email message every single week, that's when you're going to have people unsubscribing or you're going to have people not opening them because they see it come in their inbox and they're like, oh, that's just you know, her letting me know that she's going to be at the market. She says the same thing every single week. I don't actually need to click on that and open it. Now, there's still value in the fact that they see it come in their inbox, right? And they are reminded that you exist, but they may not actually click on it and open it. And you really want them to be opening the emails because that's going to make your, your rating, your score higher in the email algorithm um, and make it less likely that you end up in the promotions tab eventually. So yes, we can be announcing special product releases. Uh, you definitely want to do that, especially if you have a big promo going on or a big coupon or maybe a featured item that week that you want to make sure people know about. Okay, template number seven is brand pillars or brand hooks. 
What do I mean by this? So these are stories that you tell that are speaking to your customers' hooks. In our customer base, our ideal client has certain things that are really important to them. They're the reason, the motivators that actually cause them to buy from you in the first place. So for example, for a CSA member, one of those hooks is local. They really value supporting a local business. And that's one of the reasons that they want to stand behind a farmer and do a CSA. Okay, so if I know that local is really important to them, and I do know this because I've done customer research on them, and this is what shows up again and again and again in the research. So if I know that that's important, I might tell a story that really leans into the local piece where I talk about local or I'm highlighting something about local or standing behind a local business, okay? So that's what I mean by thinking about what are your brand hooks. When you know the hooks for your brand, usually there's like five to six of them, then you can find a story that relates to them. So every business has an ideal client. They are attracted to your product for certain reasons. Those reasons are the hooks. And we want to know what those are and then tell stories that speak to those hooks. It's going to make them feel like, oh, it's like she's in my head. She understands what's important to me. Yes, I resonate with them. Yes, this is a brand I believe in. They believe in the same things I believe in. Um, Here's an example of of the brand hook. So I happen to know that for my customer, the ability to try new varieties of vegetables is really important to them. That's one of the reasons that they love being in my traditional CSA. And so I might, as my email, tell a story about um, a weird vegetable that we're growing that's not kind of run of the mill and how my kids might, might have been initially reluctant to try it, but then they did and they loved it. Okay, I could flesh out that story a little bit more so it sounds a little more interesting, but that's the gist of the story. And at the end, the encouragement is like, hey, isn't it awesome how uh, you're getting exposed to lots of different lots of different vegetables or maybe the message is like don't be afraid to introduce your kids to a new vegetable two or three or four times it might take a while before they actually like it remember the goal of the weekly email is not always to sell something sometimes it's just to warm your customer up and to build a connection with them so that when you do have an offer later on they're more likely to trust you and have that relationship with you and they're ready to say yes Well, I hope that you see that there's actually a lot that you can talk about in a weekly email. There are so many choices. And so your call to action today, what I want you to do is to stop being nervous or scared of the weekly email. And I want you to take like 10 minutes and get out a piece of paper or get out your Google Doc. And I just want you to come up with 10 topics. I bet you could come up with 20 topics, Um, one per week that you could write about in a weekly email. And just to make this fun, I'm going to spit out six of them for you right now that you can start with. Okay. These are topics that can be the kernel of your email. Okay. Here we go. Um, Number one, teach people how they can eat raw kohlrabi with smeared peanut butter on top and then show a picture of you eating it that way. Okay. That's all you taught. That is the gem. That is it. You guys, it's amazing. It's going to blow their mind and they're all going to try it. It's awesome. Number two, you could do a quick teaching about the braconid wasp and those darn tomato hornworms and how those wasps lay eggs in them. And yeah, that whole cool story. It's going to blow their mind. It's one of those peek behind the kimono, how life really works on the farm. Really cool. Number three, you could talk about your favorite beer and why you like it so much. If it's not beer, if it's wine, if it's I don't know, whatever, your favorite something, fill in the blank, and why you like it so much. Number four, um, how boring it is to drive a tractor when you're planting onions. I did an Instagram story on this, I think, two years ago because I was trapped on the tractor, and we were going so incredibly slow. And I remember I took, like, ten different vignettes on my Instagram story and, like, all the different things that I tried to do to make it more interesting. Um, but you could you could tell a story about that. You could do on uh, number five – How learning to be good at CSA takes a couple years. You could just share that piece of wisdom. Be like, hey, by the way, you should know this. Don't expect to be amazing at this right away. And flesh that out a little more. Number six, you could review 
How to pick up a CSA share. That kind of sounds boring, but that could be a topic of a weekly email as you're getting closer to the start of the season. One of your topics could just be like frequently asked questions like, hey, let's let's run through some logistics again. I'm going to remind you how you pick up your CSA share. Here's a quick video I made of me driving through the whole process. Okay. I just gave you six topics right there. Helps you get the brain flowing, get, get ideas flowing. Now I want you to go sit down on a Google Doc and type out 14 more, and boom, you've just got 20 topics for your weekly email ready to go. So when it's time to sit down, you just go and look at that and go, hmm, all right, I can do this. All right, so that's your call to action. Come up with some ideas now so you're not stuck later when you're really busy. And I want you to set a regular day of the week to send that email. You got to get it in writing. Put it on your calendar and be like every Thursday or every Wednesday or whatever the day is for you, make it a system. If you don't make it a system, it's not going to happen consistently. And just start writing every week. Or if you decide it's going to be every two weeks, fine, but put it on your calendar to make sure that it happens. Now, before I let you go, I just want to remind you, I have an entire episode all about email tips, top tips for writing better emails. It is episode 18. So go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 18. That is a must listen because there are some things you need to know about how to actually format the email and how to write it, things like, hey, don't make giant long paragraphs, put a lot of white space in. Like I give you a lot of tips that are going to make it more likely for your customer to actually read the whole email. So make sure you go listen to that. I didn't want to repeat all of that in today's episode and be superfluous so or be repetitive. Okay, I hope this was helpful for you. I am now going to go and write my weekly email to my farmers about this podcast, but also my weekly email to my CSA and my farm audience. I want to challenge you to do the same thing. You guys, you can do this. This is an important part of staying connected with your members and your future leads. You've worked so hard to get them on your email list. Do not let them fall into the black hole and never talk to them. So before I let you go, if you are still trying to sell CSA shares for your farm, I want to invite you to participate in something called CSA Week. Now, CSA Week is happening February 21st through the 28th. And it's the one week during the year when CSA farms around the country unite to promote CSA and get people to sign up for their CSAs. If you need some help in building a promotional campaign to sell your CSA shares, whether it's during this big promo CSA week or some other type of time of year, um, I want to invite you to the free CSA Ideas Lab webinar that's hosted by the CSA Innovation Network. The date is February 2nd, 1 to 2.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the name of the webinar is Strategies to Promote Your CSA During CSA Week and Beyond. And it's going to be led by myself and my co-host, Trisha Phelps from Taste the Local Difference. Together, we are going to cover six messaging hooks that will resonate with the ideal CSA customer so you know what words to use when you're actually trying to advertise and promote your CSA. And then we're going to share four simple online marketing strategies to promote CSA during CSA week or, frankly, any time of year. So you'll also receive a free promotional template kit that you can then use to help build those promo campaigns. So to get that, um, sign up at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash ideas lab. I made a uh, simple, pretty link for that. So you can just type that in. It's going to take you to their webinar registration page. And that way you can register for it. Again, the date is February 2nd, 1 to 2, 15 p.m. They will have a replay available. So if you can't make it live, just sign up anyway. That way you can get that promo kit and watch the training at your own time. Well, thanks for joining me for another episode of the My Digital Farmer podcast. If you want to grab the show notes, go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 92. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe tab so that I can tune into your earbuds next week as well. I hope you have a wonderful week and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.